Okay, welcome back to Kingdom 101, and uh, we're going to get into this evening's message. The title for this evening is called Return. But before that, let's do a quick recap. Last week, we actually went through um, quite a lot. We went through the person of John the Baptist as well as the ministry. And these are really the nine points, right? So very quickly, number one, we acknowledge and establish that he was the prophesied Elijah mentioned in Malachi. John the Baptist also bridged the Old Testament and the New Testament. John knew his place and served to always point to Jesus. John the Baptist also announced the kingdom boldly and without compromise. And he was very clear, he was there to prepare God's people for the coming king. He was that voice in the wilderness, and he had a voice and he was not afraid to use it. We also see from his lifestyle that he embraced the wilderness until it was time for him to be revealed to Israel. Not only that, in his ministry he faced rejection and retaliation for righteousness' sake. But most importantly for us, at least you know, in this meeting, is that John knew his assignment and he finished his race. So there's a lot that we can learn from John. And as I concluded, I wanted to make that point for us that before the coming of a king, there's always someone who goes before him. So for Jesus' first coming, John the Baptist was the one. The question is, before his second coming, will there be also an announcement? Now, there could be someone who would come specifically in the power and the spirit of Elijah. But until that time where we see the appearance of someone like that, I don't think it stays silent. There's no 400 years of silence for us. We as the church, the disciples of Jesus Christ, do you know we are that voice? And we need to be the one declaring the coming of the King soon. We have a voice and we mustn't be afraid to use this voice. Not all of us are called to stand in a public square or in a pulpit to declare, but you know, you have a voice that you can share with someone about the coming King. Tonight, we're going to go into John's very first word as recorded when he started to preach. When John came out of the wilderness, or in the wilderness, he declared this, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We want to study this word called repent. And I'll show you the key verses taken from this passage. We're going to camp in this passage for the next few weeks, as you understand. Matthew chapter 3, verses one to 12, and then after that, all the way to 17, we will cover the entire Matthew chapter 3 um, over seven weeks. In Matthew 3, verses 5 onwards, we see that Jerusalem, all Judea, all the region around the Jordan went out to John the Baptist, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. A few verses down in verse 8, we know that John calls out, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who appeared on the scene. And he says to them to bear fruits worthy of repentance. And then in verse 11, he clarifies, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he is coming after me, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. See, today's context shows us that this word repentance is being challenged. But more accurately, it's really the understanding of repentance that has been redefined and also repackaged. And so I want Holy Spirit to teach us this evening. I want us to get into this evening's message asking the Spirit to come upon His Word. It's not an easy topic to teach on. 
And there are many, many things and many layers that we can explore. So I want to do my best, and I want to ask the Lord to, to lead myself and also to lead you too. Will you pray with me? Lord Holy Spirit, we commit everything to you, Lord, this evening's message, Lord, all that has been prepared. We know, Lord, that the word without you will just be something that tickles our ears, and we are not satisfied with that. We want you to burn deep within our hearts, Lord. We want you to stir within us. But Lord, we also want you to be the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever our King stands for, that is what we want to know. We want to pray for you to be the spirit of illumination so that you will bring understanding and revelation for us to understand this word well. Because we understand that today, this is being challenged. So help me, Lord, and help my brothers and sisters too as we go through this together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have to ask ourselves, what is repentance? What is repentance? If we look at a word study, the Greek word for to repent is this verb called metanoio. And it means to change one's mind. That's the literal meaning of this one word. Metanoia is repentance. Metanoia is repent. To change one's mind. It's a new way of thinking, in other words. But the question is, is it just a new way to think about something? Does it just involve the intellectual and the mental faculties only? Because you'll realize that today, making its rounds in Christian circles, there's this new discovery and this new revelation because someone pulled out this word called metanoia and said, you see, to repent means just to change your mind. To repent means simply a whole new way of thinking. That was what John meant. So what I'd like to go through with you is some of the statements that are being thrown around today. They sound very good. I want to admit that. Okay? But they are actually inaccurate and might I share with you also highly deceptive. So as I flesh these words for you, what is repentance in these uh, new fangled type of thinking? I want you to look at these statements and process also for yourself. The first statement that is being taught is, New Testament repentance simply means to change the way you think about God and just to come into agreement with Him. Now that sounds interesting, right? That sounds nice. You say, yeah, well, I, I don't see anything wrong with this. So if I tell you God is good, you say, okay, I agree. Yes, all the time, God is good. I agree God loves me. He wants to bless me. He wants to make me happy. And he tells you now you must think that, you know, God never gets angry. He's always in a good mood because he's so good and he's so loving and he's so gracious. Can you see where am I going with this? Right? So we are starting to define God in a way that we want to understand him. Oh, because of Jesus, this God whom you serve, he will always overlook all the wrong things that you do. Once you begin to know this God in this way and you change the way you think about God, because last time you used to think, you know, oh, if I don't do this, God gets upset, you know. Uh, a God's an angry God. He's full of wrath. That's a wrong way of thinking. That's what they're trying to tell us. So to repent, if I ask you to repent, it means change the way of thinking. God is not like that anymore. The Old Testament God was like that. But now in the New Testament, He is no longer like that. How about His ways? Oh, since you can't make it anyway, don't try. That's called legalism. Change the way you think. You can't make it, but so don't have to. How liberating. How about works? Or in our ministry, we are asking people to understand assignments. No need. 
It's all done. Jesus on the cross said it's finished. Everything is about grace. Change the way you think. You don't have to do anything. We're going to close in prayer now. How about sin? Oh, think about sin? No need. On the cross, totally dealt with. You don't have to do with it anymore. And so stop focusing on sin. If you don't focus on sin, sin will not disturb you. Really? Just change the way you think. That's the first statement. The New Testament repentance just means change the, your view about God. But let me give you a word of caution. What is your thinking based on? If your thinking is based on one portion of Scripture, how about the other parts of Scripture? What is your thinking based on? If your thinking is based on you know, your worldview that is anywhere but biblical, then what you think about God may not be accurate in the first place. See the big problem here? So that's the first statement. Now after he, this statement, another popular one is this. All your sins, past, present and future, they have been forgiven at the cross. Now this sounds right. Jesus took everything upon the cross. So all your sins, past, present and future, dealt with. Now think about this. If this statement was really accurate, then there's no need to even believe in Jesus at all because the sins are already forgiven. So why believe? This is tantamount to this concept called universalism. That everything has been forgiven, all have been forgiven, and everyone will one day be saved. No need to do anything. And this is very popular. Because they're trying to tell you, past, present, future sins, all forgiven. Let me give you a clarification. All sins paid for and all sins forgiven are two different things. Can you see the, the language that's being used? You see, when I, when I shared that one statement with you, it sounded accurate, it sounded correct, right? But now when I bring you this distinction, all the sins, past, present, future, Paid for. When are your sins forgiven? When you acknowledge your sins. You see the difference? Right? So when you and I, when we came into faith in Jesus Christ and we say, Lord, I believe that at the cross, you took care of my sins. What sin sins were these? Past. Up to that point. Forgiven. But for the present, am I still committing sins? Yes, I am. Those remain unforgiven until I acknowledge and I come to the Lord. I say, Lord, I've messed up today. Please forgive me. Done. Your sins forward have not been forgiven because you have not committed them. This is a statement that is being propagated. Because it sounds good that you don't have to repent if repentance means to acknowledge sin. You don't need to do that anymore. Just change the way you think. And you used to think that it was only for a season your sins were forgiven. And now since I tell you it's forever, change the way you think. No need to repent anymore. The third statement that's popular well, since my sins, they all have been forgiven, then there's no longer a need to confess your sins. Extremely popular teaching. Why must you confess? Every time you confess, you are calling up your own sin. And this is not supposed to be good, they say. It's called unhealthy sin consciousness. Don't be conscious of your sin because it's all gone. And then when we say, but 1 John 1 9 tells us if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just. So the Bible says that we should confess our sins. So their main contention by these preachers is that 1 John 1 9, they were written to unbelievers or people who have a Gnostic type of an understanding. 
What these features do not tell you is that if you consult your many commentaries, many researchers and many scholars, very few of them agree with their statement. 1 John 1 9 is written to the church. It's written to the body of believers. And we need to examine the context of 1 John 1 9. If you look at this verse here, verse 9, that's the verse in question. Look at the words we. Who's the we? Obviously, the body of Christ, right? The community that John was writing to. If we confess our sins, that's talking about us, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So these preachers actually say, no, this is not for the church, it's for the unbelievers. But the moment you say that, then you have taken this entire verse out of its context. So if you glance from verse 1 all the way to verse 10, which I've highlighted for you, this entire passage talks about we, our, us, we, us, our fellowship, we, we have fellowship, we walk in the light. Can you see? If you keep this verse in its context, the entire passage is referring to the body of Christ writing to one same group of people. If you also look at the word confess, in the English, we only see as a present tense. But in the original language, the present tense implies ongoing action. So a more accurate translation would be if we keep on confessing. It's an ongoing relationship of confession as we come with God. It's not a confession of sin for salvation because we've already done that. But as we journey in our walk with God, we sin and we want to keep clean with the Lord in that sense. And we ask once again for the Lord to cleanse us from this unrighteousness. If you remember Jesus giving an illustration to Peter, remember Jesus was supposed to wash the feet of the disciples. And Peter says, oh, no, 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 you cannot do that for me, right? And Jesus says, well, then you have no part of me. Then, Jesus, then Peter said, oh, then not my feet, but my entire body too. And Jesus then says, those who have bathed need only, you're already clean. But when you walk, your feet get dirty. So you only need to wash your feet. You see that? And so it's a beautiful illustration that we who have been saved by Jesus, we have already been made clean by Him. But as we walk this walk, we still pick up the filth and the the dirt that surround us. So we come to the Lord asking for forgiveness and He cleanses us. The fourth statement, since our sins are already forgiven, since there is no need to confess our sins, Now they go as far as to say the Holy Spirit does not convict believers of their sins. And they are even convinced enough to say that there are no Bible verses to show that this is true. The Holy Spirit convicts the world. That's what it says in John. So that's for unbelievers. Even then they have a dispute whether the Holy Spirit does that or not. But for believers, no need. There's no verse that says that. That's what these preachers are saying. So let's look at this word called convict. This one word, elenko, which translated convict, can also be translated into other words like convince, reprove, correct, rebuke, discipline. Same word. But the nuance of this word gives us the different English translations. I'll just give you all the verses in one go. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Or some say it's God breathed. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it's profitable for doctrine and for what? For reproof. Which is the word elenko, which means to convict. 
So if we agree that the Scripture is God-breathed, Holy Spirit-inspired, as we read the Word of God, who convicts us? The Holy Spirit. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.20, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all. Now how would Timothy know? Obviously, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Preach the Word. As you preach the Word, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. And so as I preach the Word, am I the one scolding you, rebuking you? I'm not the one. I'm just declaring the Word. But as I declare the Word, and the Holy Spirit comes upon that Word, and into your heart, what does He do to you? He rebukes you. He convinces you. You see, He convicts you. Does the Holy Spirit still do that work? I believe He does. Hold fast the faithful word, Paul tells Titus in 1.9, that he, meaning the elder, may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convict those who contradict. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke, convict with all authority. Obviously, must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. But if you say, oh, but these are for men and women of God, then why don't we look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by whom? By Him. The Holy Spirit still convicts. Are you convinced? James 2.9 but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. But the law will only bring death, but the Holy Spirit will bring life. The Holy Spirit still convicts by the law also, but in the spirit of life. See, if you say that the Holy Spirit does not convict anymore, what do you do with the words of Jesus in the book of Revelation? where he writes to the seven churches, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Obviously, the Holy Spirit would be convicting the believers in the church. Have you heard these statements before? Yes or no? Some of you have, right? And some maybe for the first time. But I want to warn you that this is quite um, popular these days. Now, why come up with all these statements? That's because they have changed their mind. Remember, changed the way they think. And they believe that God does not want you to feel bad about yourself. I mean, God's a good God, amen? God loves you. God's a gracious God. God doesn't want you to feel bad about yourself. I'll be very honest, huh? that statement, this statement is a, is a very clear sign of number one, superficiality, number two, immaturity, and number three, selfishness. Do you realize that many have even carried this kind of a thinking, not so much theology, they've carried this thinking into their parenting styles, many parents today, because they are afraid to offend their children. They don't want their kids to feel bad, so everything has to be good. You know, we've got to you know, give them what they want. Uh, we can't argue with them. You know, nowadays, they're so smart. They, they, they talk back at you. What to do? I don't want to offend them. Otherwise, they don't want to talk to me anymore. What, what if they leave home and they like their friends better than I do? That's not parenting by God's way. Consider again the words of Jesus to the seven churches and see whether when, when He said these words, do you think the people would feel good about themselves? To Ephesus, He says, I have this against you. You have left your first love. To Pergamos, He says, I have a few things against you. Repent or else I'll come to you quickly and fight them with a sword in my mouth. To Sardis, He says, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. To Laodicea, he says, because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. 
I don't think that felt very nice. Jesus wasn't there to make them feel good. But because Jesus loves the church, He wants them to get onto the right track with Him. And I believe God will say what He needs to say if He wants us on the right track with Him. What do you do with verses like 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 to 10, where Paul says, you know, I, I, I don't feel bad that I've made you sorry. That's what Paul said. And he explains, because godly sorrow produces repentance. And repentance leads to salvation. Now think about this, friends. Paul was writing to people who were saved. They're believers. They're Christians. And yet he tells them, as I call out your sin, I'm not sorry for making you sorry, because if you are sorrowful in the right manner, godly sorrow will produce the repentance that's needed. And this repentance is important because it will lead you along this journey as you were saved, that you continue being saved and that you will one day be saved. What should we do with James chapter 4, 7 to 10? Where James had very, very strong words. He tells his people, please, don't be, don't be double-minded people. Lament, mourn, and weep. James was writing to Christians. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Let your joy to gloom. He wasn't afraid of God making these people feel bad. What do you do with scripture like that? You see, this is the point I'm trying to, to, to drive home to the believers of our day. There's one other statement and I'll leave you with this one. God sees you as perfect, righteous, and holy, and He does not see you as sinful. That sounds like an accurate statement. And it is true that we have the righteousness of Jesus imputed upon all of us. If not, where would we be? But you see, there's a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, where Paul says, therefore, although you have these promises of righteousness, of holiness, you know, of being God's people, Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Did you hear what Paul said? Although we have all these promises, and we should rejoice because of these promises, friends, let us cleanse ourselves. There's still a process towards holiness. What we have is positionally, we are holy. Positionally, we are righteous before Lord, the Lord. Remember last week I shared with you that when John announced the kingdom, he says that the kingdom of God is at hand, which means it is near. And my personal conviction is that the kingdom is here, but not yet. In the same way, we live in the tension of already, but not yet. And this is what believers have to remember. We have it, but not yet. And that's a beautiful tension that we have. Because we have all these things, we are right with God, and that's why when we fail and when we falter, we can have boldness to come into His presence without fear of getting zapped. And so what we have already, it is to our advantage and to our privilege by His grace so that as we come into His presence, He deals with us for those that we do not have yet. You have to look at these two correctly and hold it in proper tension. But these preachers tell you, you're already perfect, you're already holy, you're already righteous, there's nothing you need to do about it anymore. What they try to recover, they tend to push to an extreme at the expense of our, all other scripture. And whenever you hold one truth to an extreme at the exclusion of other truths, then you are no longer walking in the full counsel of God. And that extremity can be referred to as heresy. 
See, I want to start with this because I want you to know what's out there in the market, so to speak. So what is repentance, if we want to understand from John the Baptist? Do you remember that John the Baptist bridged both Old Testament and the New Testament? So you can't really place him, right? He comes in in a New Testament text, but really he's before Jesus. So he's like a little bit Old Testament, he's a little bit New Testament. So he straddles across these two places. And until John the Baptist, and from John the Baptist, you know, he is that transitional point. So would it be fair to say that when he comes onto the scene, he is not declaring a new thing at all. He is continuing what the people already know. Yes? It's not a new concept. But let's understand a little bit what the Old Testament says when this word repentance or repent is used. And from there, we can then lead into the New Testament to see what it means for us today. So I've given you some references. You can go back to read the full context. But each time the word is used, it's associated with other things. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 47 says, Solomon was praying that when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive, and they repent and make supplication to you, God, in the land of those who took them captive, saying, we have sinned and done wrong. We have committed wickedness. You see that association? When they repent, this is what they say. So repentance has something to do with sin, has something to do with doing wrong and the committing of something that is wicked. Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 5 to 6. Why has this people slidden back? Why has Jerusalem slidden back in a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. See this word? Return? They refuse to return. I listened and I heard, but they do not speak aright. In their refusal to return, they did this. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his own course. Can you get the idea now? No one repented. In their non-repentance, they refused to return. Instead, they kept going the direction of their own liking. Jeremiah 25, 4, 5. And the Lord has sent to you all the servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, Repent now, everyone, of his evil way and his evil doings. Jeremiah 31, 18 to 19. In verse 19, it says, Surely after my turning... I repented. Can you see returning, turning, repent? There's something there. After I was instructed, I struck myself on the tie. I was ashamed. Yes, humiliated. Hold these thoughts for a while. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent, turn away, Repent, turn away from your idols. Repent, turn your faces away from all your abomination. And the last one, Ezekiel. The Lord says, repent, turn from all your transgressions. Can you see clearly that repentance is not merely just a change of your mind. It's not just a change of a way of thinking, you know, so that if I, if I don't think this, it won't happen to me. And today we're told, you know, don't, don't think about sin. If you don't think sin, then there's no sin. Wow. It's, a, it's an extension of the positive thinking mantra, you understand? There's another word we can use for this kind of thinking. It's called denial. It's not there, it's not there, it's not there. But actually it's just standing there right next to you. Oh, but it's not there. It's not there. 
Someone gave this illustration. I mean, you know, imagine that if you were coming from uh, uh, somewhere to this location and you're taking an MRT and you want to come this place. But you, you know how you get into MRT and there are two ways, right? And you happen to hop to the opposite one and you run and you go. And suddenly you're wondering, hey, how come the station names look different? And you ask this near la uh, lady next to you and she tells you, oh, actually you're going in the wrong direction. You say, oh, I see, okay. I'll just change my mind. I think I'm going in the right direction. <laughs> Does it work? It doesn't work, you understand? So this is what it, we're being told. If repentance is just a change. Now, it does involve some change in thinking. Don't get me wrong. But you see from these verses, is a lot more than that. And so I want to suggest to you and share with you what I believe biblical repentance is all about. Honestly, I have not heard a message on repentance of late. No one likes to preach repentance. It's like as if the fire and brimstone days are over, you see. We're in a new season. And so it blessed me as I revisited these points. I would say to you, these are not new points of discovery. But I think it would be good reminders for us. Biblical repentance has three parts. The first thing about repentance is there's confession. When John shouted, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We read in verses 5 and 6, all the people came to him, they were baptized by him in the Jordan, doing what? Confessing their sins. The first thing about repentance is that there has to be an acknowledgement and an admission that you have sinned. Otherwise, why are you repenting? What are you repenting of? The word confess comes from a Greek that is a compound that means to agree, to declare openly, to speak out your agreement. So when we are confessing our sins, what we are saying is, I am openly agreeing with God that I have strayed from Him and I have not walked in His ways. Openly. This is my confession. Because that's what sin is. A straying from His perfection, a straying from His plans, a straying from His instruction and so on. We have missed the target. And I think it's good that we acknowledge it. Let's be clear. But repentance is more than just acknowledging and admitting a wrong. Do you know that in the book of Exodus, you will read that Pharaoh actually comes to, to Moses and says, okay, okay, I admit, I, I've sinned against God. I've done wrong. He actually admits it. But you see, if nothing changes from that point on, then that's not total repentance. How many of us have try to correct maybe a child or maybe someone else, you know, and, and we say, you know, this is what you have done wrong. And they just look at you and say, yeah, 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 yeah I was wrong. And you say, oh yeah, you're not very repentant then. Right? You, you can see from their attitude, but all they're saying is, so I wrong, lah, so what? The, the attitude is just totally wrong. And they have to repent on that, of, of, of that even. So an admittance of sin only does not constitute the fullness of the understanding of repentance. Think about it for ourselves. Many times we acknowledge a sin or we come to a, an awareness that we have done wrong and someone points it out to us. But what's the next thing we tend to do? But. I know I should have done this, but. But you know why I did this? Because. Now that's not repentance, huh? You confess a sin, you agree, you have messed up, but you justify and you rationalize. That's not repentance. And after that, some people will blame it on the situation. They blame it on God. If you didn't do this, I would not have done that. So point one, confession. But it's, go, it's got to go to the next point. And this word is called contrition. A contrite heart. 
If confession is the admission of sin or the acknowledgement of sin, then contrition is to have sorrow over the sin. It's a deep realization that what we have done is not just wrong, but it has offended God. Not only has it offended God, some of our wrong actions, our wrong words, our wrong thoughts, it would have also offended others. When was the last time we did something wrong or out of turn and it has affected someone and then we realize it, but we don't feel bad about it? Right? Sometimes we will just justify again and say, she deserved it. I know I shouted, I lost my temper, but he deserved it. And we don't feel lousy about all that. Whether he or she deserved it is not the point. The point is, do you realize you have hurt someone? You have offended God. Look at the example of David's adultery with Bathsheba. He hurt and killed many people along the way. And it didn't just stay with that one season. It followed him, the consequences after that. Firstly, David acknowledged that he had sinned against God. In the beautiful Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned. I mean, this guy upset Bathsheba, you know, and upset so many other people, murdered other people. And, but finally, he says, when I offend other people, actually, Lord, I offend you. He, he's clear. He acknowledged it. I've done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And he knew that as king, I mean, he had a whole kingdom for him to sacrifice to God. He, he could have burned all the animals and, you know, gave all the things, you know, and, and he can do all these things. But he said that it would, have, it would have made no difference to God if his heart was not engaged in repentance. See, finally, all the time, God is always after what's within our heart because that's a real person that's inside. What we do outside uh, can be wayang. We can do it for sure. We can do it because, you know, we, we, we just have to do it. But David, right in his heart, he knew that God was after something in there. And that's why after he said in verse 16, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. It would not have been enough for David to, to, to sacrifice the bulls and the goats and the rams, you know, and do all those things if his heart was just, okay, la, I did already one. But David, as a man after God's own heart, knew he broke God's heart. When was the last time we grieved over something we did or did not do? And we knew that it grieved the Lord's heart. If we be honest, we tend to gloss over it, don't we? Now, don't get contrition wrong. Eh? It's not groveling in guilt and shame. You, you understand the difference? Contrition is not, oh, you know, crawling to God, you know, kaltao. That, that's, that's not our God. That's not contrition. And that's why if we don't understand repentance, we think that is what God is after and we don't like it. At the cross, it's clear that Jesus has taken every guilt and every shame. Amen? But you see, in my relationship with my Father, God, I still want to bring Him pleasure. We know the story of the prodigal son. The key phrase it's actually found in verse 17 when it says, but when he came to himself. When he came to himself. Suddenly, this is that moment of awakening. And you realize he has, he has hurt his father. He has sinned against his father. He has brought the father grief. That's when he turned. You see that? 
there has to be a contrition of heart. But even as we say this, you can admit sin, you can feel really bad about it, and you could just stop there. And repentance will still be incomplete. Look at the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He wasn't really repenting. I mean, he, he meant well. Right? He wanted to do the best things. And yet Jesus, when, he, when, when Jesus gave him the, a, a standard that's higher, that's beyond him, you know, he's like, oh man, I can't do that. So he admits it, number one, I can't do. Number two, he, he, he feels sorrowful. He went away sorrowful. But that, that's about it. Repentance needs a third part in that for it to be complete. Judas, when he admitted his sin, that's number one, he admitted that there was something that was wrong. He was remorseful. He was feeling so lousy about himself. But instead of turning and returning to the one that he betrayed, he turned inward and killed himself. That's not repentance. Godly sorrow produces repentance but leads to salvation. The line next to it actually says, worldly sorrow or worldly grief leads to death. You must know the difference. God does not want us to grovel in shame and guilt and kill ourselves because today in Christ, there's no condemnation. But God wants us to have a sorrow that's godly, sanctified, if, as it were, if you want to use that word. Sanctified sorrow that brings us into repentance, that points us and leads us to salvation. So the third aspect of repentance is conversion. Many times we use the word conversion to think, um, do I believe in Jesus or do I change the religion, you know, or do I change something? So in that, thing, in that nuance, I suppose you can, you can say yes, you know. We, we've turned from something to something else. So there's that conversion. We've changed. But this here really means to turn from sin and to turn back towards God. There's a change not only of mindset, there's a change also of direction that would affect also a change in our lifestyle and our behavior. So when Peter preached this in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, he says, Repent, therefore, and be converted. Repent and be converted. Turn, that your sins may be blotted out. What sins are this? Past, present, or future? Past, right? So the moment I turn from these sins, it's blotted out. Times of refreshing come. But as I journey and I veer again, God says, turn back. So I turn and I ask for forgiveness. And so my present sins, which have become past, will again be blotted out. Amen? And I'm always getting into times of refreshing with the Lord. To convert literally means to turn towards. And let's use our language. I believe this is like a call to be rightly aligned with the coming king and his kingdom. You, you notice that John, when he declares repent, he gives you the reason. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is very near. So you have a decision to make. Do you want to go on in your own direction, continue along this route, or do you want to turn? Because the kingdom is coming. There's no more time. John gave also a call for us to repent so that these can be rightly aligned with righteousness, which is really what the kingdom is all about. If you don't align with righteousness, the king of righteousness is going to come. It's not going to be good news. It's a call to align with holiness. And when we see this turning, Many of us would have this picture of a 180 degree turn. Now the truth is, as we are believers in Jesus Christ, we very possibly would have made that 180 to say, I don't want this anymore, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. But as we journey with Him, we know we deviate. Either we turn back to our old ways, some 180, but some, maybe you are really wanting to live the righteous life, maybe you veer 10% or 10 degrees, or 20 degrees, and we think that's okay. The call is still there to return, back to a true north, back to the right direction. What then is the evidence of true repentance? How do we know 
whether we are on that road of constant repentance and is effective. So John says to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, if you say you truly repent, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. So if you want to check your repentance, look for fruit. <laughs> you, you notice something? Jesus is always asking for fruit. He's always accounting for fruit. God is always looking for fruit. Every many parables in the, in the Gospels is always about agriculture, about bearing fruit. And we as trees and oaks of righteousness should be bearing fruits of righteousness if we have truly repented. One of the greatest challenges for us in the 21st century is that because we have grown up, thank God for that, in a largely Judeo-Christian side of our background, morally, we are sort of okay. Right? We, we don't rob the banks and we don't, think, we don't do things like that. So we, we cut corners. We, we make excuses for ourselves to think that we're actually quite okay. And we actually minimize sin and we don't talk about it too much. But if we want to look at true repentance biblically, remember again, first thing, there must be confession. Next, contrition. Thirdly, conversion. These are the three things. And ultimately, it points to a turning back. Always a turning back. Always a turning back. As I looked at this and as I prepared, I realized one revelation about this topic. I think I need to repent of not having truly repented. Either I don't understand it, or I, I again take shortcuts. All I've done is simply acknowledge my own sin and I go back right to committing it again. Who wants to say amen with me? Will you agree? I think we, we, we struggle with this. And I think it's good if we come to terms with it. Let me give you an example. The Lord says, observe the Sabbath. Rest. And I said, yes, Lord, I need to rest. And the moment I say I need to rest, I go back to work. Isn't it odd? Or someone tells you, you've got to rest. You cannot go on like this. The Lord says, observe the Sabbath. Rest. It's created for you. And you say, yeah, 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 yeah. Trula, trula, I must rest. But you don't. How many of you know that that requires repentance? Right? How about idolatry? Loving the neighbor? Covetousness or greed? I acknowledge we are, we are, I'm covetous. But I don't, I don't feel bad about being covetous. <laughs> After that, I don't turn from my covetousness. I continue to, to fuel my own consumeristic tendencies. When I see something that looks really good bargain, I look at how much I can save, but I don't realize how much I need to spend before I can save that. It's very quiet suddenly. How about my greed? How about my denying of myself? You know, I acknowledge, oh, I, I don't deny myself. You know, but I don't feel bad about my demi not denying myself. And I don't make any attempt by the help of the Holy Spirit even to deny myself sometimes. And as I looked at this, I realized, I said, well, let's look at our keeper's awakening. And you know, some people will still keep making excuses for themselves. One of the tenets of our keeper's awakening is that we will be aware but not apathetic. But the truth is, we continue to be aware and continue to be apathetic and not move. I said, Lord, how, how do you, you know, I'm not turning. You're making me aware, but I'm, I'm just saying, yes, I'm aware. But I'm still really going in the wrong MRT direction. I'm not willing to turn because it costs me too much. We make a distinction between activity and assignment. And we say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I speak to people and immediately they get back into activity again. Because it's too difficult to turn. We talk about Christians being aimless. And we love being aimless. And I realize, I think we need to repent of not having truly repented. And maybe that's why, as I was reflecting, because we do not truly and fully understand what repentance is, and we have not truly repented, perhaps that's why we're not seeing the fruit that we ought to be seeing. Think about that. Ponder that. Pray through that. 
And this is not about a condemnation because we're all in that same boat. But if we would apply this and say, Lord, you help me. You're the king. You're the kingdom. Help me align back to you. What do I need to de-align? How have I been misaligned? What should I realign? Lord, help me. Would we begin to see fruit? I think so. And so repentance is really summed up in this one word called turn or return. That we must continually turn from sin and to constantly, continually return to Jesus. Some people only like to say that the Old Testament repentance is turning from sin. The New Testament repentance is turning to Jesus. You, you can't have one without the other. It's both ends. You must always turn from something to something. Now John's baptism was one of repentance. And as he straddled, he called the people to turn from their sins. And the people would be sincere, they would come. But after that, as they try not to sin, it would still be their own efforts to keep the law. Is it not so? And that's why the wonderful thing about John is that he didn't stop there. After he calls them, he says, go towards righteousness, go to holiness and fruitfulness. And now John points to Jesus and he says, I only baptize you into repentance. I'm bringing you step one. And as you want to turn back to God and you realize how tough it is, I'm going to show you the one who's going to help you. And he says, there's one who's coming after me. He's mightier than I am. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You will realize that as you try to live this life, to keep turning and keep turning, you will find that you will keep failing and you, know, you will not be able to make that. But when Jesus comes and you put your trust in Him, He takes away all that condemnation and all that guilt and all that shame. And as you turn to Him, He baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. Not only that, you will have the enablement now of the Holy Spirit to help you in this process of repentance. See, John doesn't stop there. He always points to the person and the ministry of Jesus. Friends, grace has always been there for us. Every time we come to God, even in the Old Testament when they came, it was always about grace. God would extend grace upon grace. And when Jesus comes, He exemplified both grace and truth. And the truth is, repentance remains relevant. Repentance remains relevant. Because you and I continue to sin. And so we must now come in that provision of forgiveness to appropriate it, not having to go through the hoops, don't have to jump through things. Jesus that sacrificed once for all, appropriate it and keep returning back to Him. Biblical repentance, let me conclude, is confession, contrition, and conversion. As I close, let us once again admit that we have not truly, really repented. Often, perhaps, we have treated sin too lightly. Often justifying and rationalizing, and of this, we need to repent and stop doing that. And should we catch ourselves doing it? Run into the throne of bone, uh, grace with bone and say, Lord, Holy Spirit, help me so that it will be you Christ in me, living through me, and not myself. Let us be aware that the idea or mention of sin is also not popular today. The redefinition of repentance is around because no one wants to feel lousy about themselves. And they do away with remorse or sorrow that we've offended God. I hope I have not caused you to feel lousy about yourself this evening. That is not my intention. But I want you all and myself to understand that God has given us so much. He has done so much for us. And you know, there's a verse in Romans that says, His goodness leads us to repentance. Amen? So we look upon what He has done and we grieve that we continue to hurt Him. 
That should be the right way of understanding. Even God is being recreated or to fit our image and expectation of He should be and how He should act. Of that, we must repent. We must return. We take one portion of Scripture, we stretch it to an extreme, ignoring, cancelling the other portions we don't like. We love the blessings, but we totally disregard, disregard the warnings. Of that, we must repent and return. And remember, it's not just saying, yes, 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 I agree. Yeah, we, yeah. It's really a turning back. Amen? And so as we close, I want to invite you to realign. To re realign with the Lord. Because it's as we realign that we begin to understand the direction that the kingdom is moving. And God uses also assignments to reveal to us how disaligned or unaligned we are most of the time. And that's why we wrestle with kingdom assignments. We may say we want to know what it is, but I submit to you that when the Lord does show us what it is, many of us will struggle with it, you see. And that's because we have not fully turned from what we have held dear most of the time. We usually want God to turn and accommodate us. But God is saying, look, the kingdom is advancing. You are to align with the kingdom. So let's close our eyes. Let's put away our notes. I want to pray with you and pray for you. And allow me just to take a few more moments, allowing you some time to just pause and just to reflect what I've shared with you about repentance. And I want to invite you from wherever you are, where you are seated. There'll be no raising of hands because I believe all our hands will be up. Where you are, will you just utter a prayer of confession, even just to bring your heart to the Lord, to say, Lord, forgive me where I've not felt bad about anything wrong I've done. I've justified it. And resolve, not by your own strength, that you would turn perfectly and do everything well. Because you will only set yourself up for a fall. But as you decide and desire to turn and return, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Standing upon all that Christ has done, resting in the grace that is provided for us. Father God, this is a solemn moment for us. We come before you, Lord, not to grovel, not in shame, not in guilt, Lord, because everything has been taken care of at the cross by Jesus for us. But because of your goodness, O oh Lord, you have drawn us to understand what repentance is. We want to confess, Lord, that we have not understood it well. We want to admit, O oh Lord, that we have taken things too lightly. We want to confess, Lord, that many times we admit a wrong, but we justify it. And then we continue to do it, thinking that everything is going to be all right. Lord, forgive us because we know that this displeases you. Lord, Holy Spirit, convict us, Lord. And bring godly sorrow that finally leads to salvation and life and freedom. So many of us need to realize that, Lord. Because as we sow, we also reap. And as we have not sown repentance, we are reaping its consequences too. But Lord, we're not going to stop there. We will turn, Lord from all that you show us and convict us that is not right. And we're turning back to you, Lord, because that's the direction of the kingdom and you're coming for us soon. And as we turn away from these, we, we cry out to you because you know how difficult it is for us. And that's why you gave us Holy Spirit. That's why you gave us Christ in us, Lord. That this life that we live, we no longer live unto ourselves but it is Christ who lives in us. And we appropriate that by faith. So teach us, Lord, to rest in you. Teach us, Lord, to cease from our own works, Lord, that we will return, return, and keep returning. Lead us, Lord. And I thank you that we have a community here, Lord, that today, now, tonight, understand what repentance is. We can walk with one another. We can pray for each other we can encourage one another. Because Lord, we all want to walk in that same direction. 
And that's the way of the kingdom. Lord, thank you for this teaching. Thank you for this grace, Lord, that we stand into. As we close, we praise you. We glorify you, Lord. We magnify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.